mercy, we come to you this day seeking your healing and reconciling love. Help us to be open to your word, your presence, and your compassion. Clear our hearts of those things which block your will. Keep us focused on your enabling power so that we, having been healed, may more fully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. reading is Psalm 82. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked, Selah? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. Prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary. Lord, 
prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Good morning and welcome to Church on the Couch. I am really pleased to introduce my team today. Sue Candy, who is the organist and choir director from Pentonville United Methodist Church. Karen Fuller, who is serving as our liturgist today. And Lisa Kisselstein, who is providing special music. And beginning today, uh, we offer two services, this one online. And earlier today, we provided church in the car. And that will be the new routine for us, the twin sisters, uh, as we uh, provide worship in different ways here at Pentonville. When we're in the sanctuary, we offer our joy separately than our concerns. And I have not been doing that uh, while we've been online. But because it's a new day, I decided to do it a little bit differently today. Because we've been talking an awful lot about all the things that are so different and so difficult. But I just wanted to lift up some joys. And uh, one is this team that I just introduced to you. They have made worship fun. They have uh, made it innovative. They've made a really difficult time seem normal for folks, and people have been uh, very appreciative and been sending us messages of thanksgiving for them. So I wanted to say it uh, in front of uh, them and you and God and everyone at the same time. So thank you. We really appreciate the work that you've done. And also, friends, on the couch, we, the four of us, and Diana Gardner, who usually joins us and joins us this morning for Church in the Car, really appreciate you. You have uh, added to our time of worship and uh, we went into this not knowing what this was going to be like and this has been a special time and we thank you for all of your feedback and for your faithfulness. Last week the Penneville and the Baldwinsville churches joined together in a car parade uh, celebrating eight graduates between the two churches and that was very joyful. We had 20, 20 folks and they traveled close to 80 miles as we drove uh, from here, there, and everywhere, from Baldwinsville to Liverpool to back to Clay to Penneville, and then folks went back to Baldwinsville. That was very joyful, and we do congratulate our graduates. And next week at Church on the Couch, we will uh, take a special moment to uh, congratulate the graduates, and we'll also be celebrating fathers, if I've got the right day. I think I do. Today's the 14th, so yes, next Sunday. So those are the joys. And now let us just, we're going to uh, celebrate with the hymn, Lord of the Dance.
now take the joys that I've named and the joys that you have in your heart. And let us bring those prayers that need for intercession, those concerns. Let us bring those all to God this morning in our morning prayer. Let us pray. God of unlimited grace, we thank you for this day, this whole day. You've provided us from sunrise, sunset, to bringing of new dawn. That's a day. That's all we need. One complete day. Help us to live in it. Help us to breathe in it. Help us to make a difference in it. Lord God, gather us in. Bring us to this place. Bring us in a time of prayer. Bring us to a time of listening. Help us to hear you in such a way that it speaks to the rhythms of our heart. Lord God, we are in changing times. We're in difficult times. It's easy for us to get discouraged as we look out onto our world. It's a place that seems more divided than united. And we still see uh, so much struggle with the coronavirus. And as we're reopening, we see that some folks are taking more risk than is necessary. And we also see that the, the illness is still ahead of us. We pray that uh, for the front line, for all those who are caring for folks in the hospitals, and we pray for those families who are tending to folks with this virus. And we pray for all the communities that are uh, have been touched by it and who are continuing to work to restore economic health as well as physical health. And Lord God, we do pray for our community. We pray for this community of faith. And we pray for our state, our state leadership. And we pray for our nation. Lord God, we pray that each one will have wisdom as they develop and live out policies for the sake of the people. Lord God, you heard our prayers. We bring them to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, 
passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for an extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Fall fresh on each one of us gathered here so that both speaker and hearer will know your will for us today. Amen. In these difficult days, I have been praying increasingly for God to come near, for us to feel God's presence in ways that maybe we haven't before. I've even pleaded for God to surprise me. A couple weeks ago, I really felt the need to pray in community. So I sent an email inviting some of the folks from church to come pray with me by Zoom. And I didn't know how many or if any were going to show up on such short notice on a Sunday afternoon. And 12 people joined me for prayer. And it really was an incredible time of prayer. It was a surprise I needed. It was a surprise I had been praying for. But yet when it was all done, I said to myself, I didn't expect that. I, I really didn't expect that. You'd think that by now, I would know that our God works in the unexpected. You would think that by now, I would know that God is always tipping our expectations upside down. After all, this is the God of the burning bush. This is the one who parted the Red Sea. This is the one who came in the flesh as a baby. And I'm not sure anyone expected the cross. And vulnerability and suffering is not something that we expect from God. So the message that you heard today, the story of the Good Samaritan, is actually pretty startling. In teaching about loving our neighbor, Jesus uses three familiar figures and one unfamiliar one. The man who is robbed and beaten is one of them. They likely can see their own face in the pitiful creature who was robbed and left for dead. And both of the men who pass by this injured man are familiar characters in the life of Jesus' listeners. First, the priest passes by, and then the Levite crosses the street. In a story about love, anyone familiar with their role in life would expect that either or both of them would be the ones that would stop and help this injured man. But they didn't. It was the unfamiliar one, the Samaritan, who Jesus uses to teach us about mercy. Now, the Samaritan was a figure familiar to Jewish society. The Samaritans were loathed. They were considered unclean and were often hostile to Jewish people. So you see, for the one who shows mercy to be this unclean outcast is unexpected. In fact, to be the only one who shows mercy would have been shocking. But it is a point that we need to be careful not to miss. In the telling and retelling of this story, we have this tendency to turn this well-worn parable 
into a morality play that teaches us the importance of stopping and helping others, even if we don't know them or even if maybe we're afraid of them. But Jesus isn't just teaching about helping or being kind. He was speaking about mercy. Mercy, the deepest expression of kindness that can be shown. An outpouring of love and kindness that is always attributed to God, most often in the freeing of our sins. Mercy is not something that comes naturally to us. That's because God is the source. God is the initiator of love, and all we can do is reflect it. Mercy is that love in action, the love that pours out without restraint or condition. And in this story, it comes from the least expected one. We certainly didn't expect that Jesus would use the one who was rejected by his audience to demonstrate God's action in the world. Yet, yeah, it's just another reminder that God shows up where we least expect God to show up. And by being in the form of a Samaritan, Jesus is going even deeper in trying to help us understand how God's love works in the sometimes not so loving world. Remember that after Jesus told the expert in the law that the way to inherit eternal life was to live what was written in the law. But the conversation didn't stop there. The writer of Luke tells us that wanting to justify himself, the man asked Jesus another question. And who is my neighbor? He asked. Remember, justification is making it, it right with God. So self-justification would be the ability to close that gap caused by sin all by ourselves, without God's mercy. So Jesus told this parable. Perhaps the Samaritan appears in the parable to remind this self-justifying lawyer and us that not only is self-justification not possible, but when we focus on the idea of justifying ourselves, we risk missing seeing God in the most unexpected places. We risk the ability to see God in our neighbors and in our enemies. And of course, in doing that, we risk seeing the saving presence of God for our own life and for the world. As I read and reread this parable for my own life, I try to imagine the person or type of person that I would least expect God to work through. I think about all that's going on in this country and how we're mistreating each other based on religious beliefs and political beliefs, how we channel every comment through how we voted in the last election. I see the deep injustices that are committed every day based on race and ethnicity and gender and even sexual identity. And then I think, who do you have the hardest time imagining God working through right now? What person or profile would cause you to say, I didn't expect that? Well, that's who you should expect. That's the Samaritan in your story. And this isn't just a lesson. This is a promise. God comes where we least expect God to be because God comes for everybody. God comes to the self-justifying lawyer just as much as he comes to the outcast Samaritan. God comes to the refugees just as much as he comes to the people who want to keep them out. God comes to those in need, to those who help them, and to those who deny them. God comes to the people we're afraid of, to people who live differently than us and think differently than us, 
and even people who behave differently than you and I think they should. Because no one, no one is beyond the reach of God's mercy. Not a Samaritan, not you, not even me. That's mercy. And what we do with God's love is on us. How we reflect love is on us. But friends, God loves and God acts in that love regardless of our response. And when God forgives, God doesn't distinguish our faces from others. He sees our flaws and he reaches in to help anyway, regardless of our doubts, regardless of our fears. In fact, even knowing that we may not always return that love, God reaches down anyway. That's mercy. Pour it out regardless of who you are. Pour it out in ways that sometimes we can't even come close to understanding or explaining to anybody. But maybe hearing this story again in this new way will help us to begin expecting God in all the unexpected ways. Maybe if we're able to see God's love and mercy in unexpected people and in unexpected places, we can begin to expect to offer it ourselves. Maybe we can begin to reveal God's love in places and to people in such a way that it emits a response, we didn't expect that. Maybe the next time we hear or read comments that we don't agree with, we won't aim to rebuke or hurt, or, but reveal mercy instead. Maybe as we stand in the midst of a world that seeks to divide and seems to always be on the side of hate and hurt, we can love. We can show mercy. We can be the neighbor. And as we see God in each face, we can turn to one another and we can say, now that's what I expected. Amen.
God of love, give us a deep love for you so that we can see the world as you see it. Feel the compassion you feel. And be a people whose lives mediate your love to others. So open our eyes that we might see what the Good Samaritan saw. Grant us the insight to see the need in others, the wisdom to know what to do, and the will to do it. And so we pray for all those who in many and various ways have been stripped, beaten, and left for dead. We pray for children who must grow up in the most awful of circumstances, especially for those starved of love or food or shelter or security. May they receive the future you have planned for them. We pray for those we might cross the road to avoid, who have been excluded socially and marginalized, left out of society's narrowing circles. May the dignity that is theirs be restored to them. We pray for those who need we would rather not face up to because it requires action of us. Those who suffer atrocities because of war, unjust trade rules, or oppressive governments. May the world receive a true picture of their suffering and the factors that cause it, that justice may be done. Open our eyes, O oh God, that we might not cross the road from human need. Give us a deep love for you, that we might see your love at work in this world, and that we might go and do likewise. the love of God in this world, so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you a generous friend. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always.